Joining me now is Philip Rycroft, the former senior civil servant who served in a number of roles, including the permanent secretary at the Department for Exiting the EU. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Now, if I may, let's start off with Gaza. The government are under pressure over trapped Britons in Gaza uh, and getting them out. Uh, Jess Phillips said Britons were not getting out quickly enough and said the UK's diplomatic approach was not having much sway. Do you, do you think she's right? I'm absolutely no doubt that the uh, the FCDO, the Foreign Office, will be doing its utmost to get UK citizens outside of Gaza. But as the Foreign Secretary has said, this is a hugely complicated situation, a very delicate situation, and there are a lot of other countries negotiating to get their citizens out as well. So the effort will be being put in, whether the results are achieved, um, really is dependent on that very complex set of relationships with the Israelis, the Egyptians, uh, and indeed the actions of Hamas in Gaza itself. Um, but I don't think this will be down to a lack of effort. It is down to the complexities of an extraordinarily difficult uh, situation in that part of the world. Is, is it also, Philip, partly down to just pecking order in the sense that the US probably has more sway uh, because of its relations in the region than, than the UK? Yeah, uh, of course, of course, the US will have, in, in a situation like this, folk will be listening to the US. Um, countries like the UK and indeed other European countries uh, will be down that pecking order. Uh, the UK does have the advantage of well-established diplomatic networks, um, uh, you know, people who understand how to make things happen or how to try to make things happen. So it does have some advantages over other smaller countries. But even so, in this situation, uh, it'll not be the UK that's top of most people's minds in Israel and Egypt as they think about how to manage that crossing. Yeah, a very tough wait for the, the families who must be desperate for news. But more, yeah. more broadly, how do you see uh, the situation developing? Does the longer the Israel-Hamas war go on, does it make it more difficult for the West to maintain its position that Israel has the right to defend itself? It, it, the, who, who knows is the honest answer to that. And this is a, this is a situation that took um, everybody by the looks of it by surprise. Um, there have been you know, clearly very, very difficult debates about how um, the West and other countries should respond to this. Um, but the, 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 what's going on at the moment is very much in the hands uh, of, of the Israelis. They clearly have the initiative uh, now. They, uh, their military machine is taking the action that they think is fit and proper in response to the incursion into their territory and the terrible, terrible um, uh, tragedy that ensued from that. Um, and frankly, for, for a lot of countries, including the UK, um, uh, we'll be watching to see what happens. We'll not have a huge amount of influence um, over that. Um, but ultimately, everybody will wish to see the minimization, the minimization of, of, of the further loss of life um, in this. And ultimately, uh, we have to find out a way that resolves this conflict. For whatever the, the, the military solution will not be the, the uh, will not be the end of this. Um, uh, the, ultimately, this will will only um, end when there is a way for these people uh, to live peacefully side by side. Ultimately, a political solution then required. Um, Philip, can I bring you on to artificial intelligence and, and Elon Musk? Because uh, the Prime Minister's preparing to sit down for a cosy chat with Elon Musk. Um, now, if you were in an advisory role and you've got lots of experience about giving advice to, to ministers, and very senior ministers, it seems to me that the prime minister is meant to be the statesman who answers the questions, uh, not asks them. Is there a danger that in doing this, he looks like a junior partner? Well, it, it's not the first time that very senior politicians have courted um, big tech uh, uh, giants. So it used to be Bill Gates that um, prime ministers were very keen to, to get into number number 10. And Elon Musk has huge, huge influence, clearly, um, not least as a, as, a, as a big investor. And, uh, you know, who wouldn't like some of that investment coming, coming into the UK, not least in, in the car industry? 
Um, but politicians do have to be a little bit careful in this space. Nobody's elected Elon Musk. His opinions are those of a businessman. He's not a statesman. Um, and so, uh, in my view, um, uh, the politicians shouldn't look like demandeurs in terms of thinking about how businesses relate to regulation, to the business of government. Uh, it, clearly, they can court business people for their investment, uh, but they shouldn't look as though they're kowtowing to them in, in terms of the regulatory context. They should listen to their views, but it should be democratically elected politicians that take those really, really important decisions. Uh, and let's hope that's the case in the UK. And, and just finally, talking about ministerial decision making, there's been lots of talk about Whitehall this week and the importance of learning lessons. I'm referring, of course, to the COVID inquiry, the chaos in government criticism too, not just of politicians, but of civil servants as well. This has been humbling for Sir Humphrey, hasn't it? Yes, there are, there are aspects of this story that are not comfortable reading for civil servants present and past like myself. Um, the planning for COVID was clearly found wanting. The speed of reaction, uh, how Whitehall coped with this, um, was, uh, was put under serious pressure by what was an unprecedented crisis. Some things went well. Let's not forget the furlough scheme, um, the handling of the benefit system, ultimately the rollout of, of the vaccine programme as well. Um, but there is no doubt that those of us who uh, were in the system wanted more reform of Whitehall, uh, who still want more reform of Whitehall, that reform had not gone far enough and Whitehall was tested very, very severely by this crisis and, uh, in terms of its professionalism, its understanding of the issues, its grip of data and so on. So some of those criticisms absolutely justified. By the same token, what all of this shines a light on is dysfunction at the very top of government, dysfunction in the political system, uh, and does say something quite worrying about the structure of governance in the United Kingdom. And let's hope the inquiry gets into some of that as well, because out of this, we should be thinking very hard about how decisions are made, uh, about how, where the checks and balances are in the system, uh, and, and, and how the Prime Minister in particular uh, relates to uh, politicians more broadly across the system, to devolved administrations, uh, to metro mayors and local government and all the rest of it. There are a lot of really, really important lessons uh, that should emerge from this inquiry. And Philip, sorry, but just quick thoughts, I'm out of time, but just finally, uh, do you recognise what you heard when people talked of a toxic culture, an orgy of narcissism? Yeah. in Boris Johnson's I, I, number 10. What, what we've seen, I wasn't there, but what we've seen corroborates that. We've seen the WhatsApp messages, we've heard a lot of testimony. What I can say is government does not need to be like that. I worked very closely with number 10 through the coalition years and, and through Brexit, really tough times, not as tough as COVID, but very tough times. And in, in, in those days, I was dealing with special advisors and politicians who pretty much universally maintained the basic civilities of life. We could have big rows, big arguments, there were some tantrums, but by and large, uh, people remained respectful and civil. And in any walk of life, that is hugely important. So some of the stuff that we're hearing now, you know, frankly, were absolutely unacceptable in any line of business.